occasion. Of course, the occasion is uh, the new book of Karen, A Hundred Sons, and um, everything that uh, Karen is touching, doing is always a celebration, so we're really happy that she's celebrating her new book with us. Uh, both Kabir and Karin are amazing people. They're smart, creative, accomplished, and humble. So two genuine leaders, and that's what the French American Foundation is doing. We're trying to create long-lasting connection between French and American leaders. We are really happy to be joined tonight by the French Institute Alliance Française community. Uh, we know that uh, FIAF is also organizing some amazing events online. So please go ahead and have a look at their website um, as you will be able to see their calendar of events. Kabir will have the pleasure of introducing uh, Karin. So I will introduce uh, Kabir and that's not something easy to do because he's very accomplished. So, Kabir Segal is a multi-Grammy and Latin Grammy Award winner, producer, artist, and composer, who has made over 30 albums. His production have earned 14 nominations and 11 awards. He is a New York Times and Wall Street Journal best-selling author of 13 books. Some of his work are children's books, such as The Wheel of the wheels on the tuk tuk and a bucket of blessing. He has a bucket of blessing. My kid loves this book, so go ahead and have a look at his books. Uh, and actually, a bucket of blessing was adapted for a stage production, right? Um, he's also a contributor to CNBC, Fortune, and Harvard Business Review. Before uh, being such a uh, uh, celebrated author and music producer, Kirby used to work in corporate strategy at First Data Corporation. And he also worked as vice president at J.P. Morgan in emerging market equities. And because all of that is not enough, Kabir is also a US Navy veteran and a reserve officer who served on active duty with special operation in the Middle East. So Kabir, you will have to come back and talk to us about your work. Um, thank you, thank one day. Yeah, Wendy. Thank you again to both of you for joining us. Kabir, I'm going to let you introduce Karin and start the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Emily um, and Val. Thanks for setting this up. What a wonderful, what a wonderful uh, event we have today. A very special day because today is the culmination, I suppose, of many years of hard work, many years of, of um, putting thought to paper and paper to pen to write a magnificent book. And I want to uh, take a moment and I want to introduce uh, Karen Tanabe. Um, some of you already are familiar with her, but I want to give you the, there she is. I want to give you the, um, the rundown on her, on her bio, an amazing bio. She's an incredible writer. Uh, she started as a reporter, actually, a former political reporter. And her work has appeared in many publications. May, perhaps you've seen her byline in the Washington Post, the Chicago Tribune, the Miami Herald. And uh, she went from becoming a journalist to writing books. And she made the leap. And what a leap it's been. She's written um, so several wonderfully heralded books, critically acclaimed. Uh, my favorite book, I've read a, a couple of them now, Karen. My favorite one was The Diplomat's Daughter. And um, this, this is, you know, this new one seems to have some, some similar themes in there. We'll get into that. And she's written The Diplomat's Daughter, The Gilded Years which is soon to be a major motion picture starring Zendaya. So she's writing for the big screen already. That's pretty remarkable. And her recent book is called A Hundred Sons, and it's published by St. Martin's Press, the best of the best in the publishing world. And the publication date was two days ago. So this is publication week, and we're very, very excited to have the remarkable, the magnificent um, author, <laughs> thinker, conceptual artist, my friend Karen Tanabe. Welcome. Hi, Kabir. Thank you so much for that amazing intro. Coming after yours, it's sort of like, here's the sad street urchin. Um, <laughs> but you know, I bring good hair to the table. So Yeah, and, I'm, and yeah. I don't. So yeah. tell me first, where are you broadcasting from? This is the glamorous spot known as my parents' basement. 
Um, I actually, the perk of being in your parents' basement is you have like lots of embarrassing relics, like <laughs> uh, graduation. Nice. Yeah. Um, but I did a Zoom on Sunday from my house and it was very bad. <laughs> like anyone, thank you for people who come back. But it was a little spotty and I've decided my Wi-Fi is just sad. So I've come here to mooch off Boomer Wi-Fi, which is always very good. <laughs> <laughs> and what's in the bookshelf? Are those your books behind you? Well, my books, because my dad told me I should put them here. And so my dad was a book editor for the Washington Post. So both of us are like insane bibliophiles that are probably going to die by like just books falling on us. Um, so really any spot in either of our houses, there's just massive amount of books. Thus, gotcha. Gotcha. <laughs> create a background you know yes yeah, so you have the literati is part, part of your your dna so you've been yeah. surrounded by the right not to be a writer and i mean he was not wrong so <laughs> no you, you're one of the best right and i mean that sincerely we would uh so first of all congratulations on the book i know this is a Her herculean t uh, task last time we connected when i met you was it was in chicago for the french american program and you were working on it or actually bringing it to close um so so remarkable achievement. Would you please bless us with a reading? A reading, okay. Well, yes. let, me, let me give you a little backstory. Um, this book is set in 1933, Andochine, French Indochina, um, entre guerres, you know, between the wars. And it was a, a time of peace per se in Indochina, but the communists really had been moved underground because of French oppression and, um, my characters are a lot of French expats and a, a lot of uh, Vietnamese collabo, people who are French sympathizers. And then also you have um, sort of the more proletarian Vietnamese, which is you know most of the country. The passage I'm gonna read from is a flashback to Paris. Um, there are many parts in the book that are set in Paris and they're the most fun because it's the twenties and I mean, who doesn't want to be in Paris in the 20s? And I always say every book I write has a cocktail party. I can't not do it. I just, I can't. I don't know what it is. Call me a bon vivant drunk, but like I must <laughs> have a cocktail party in every book. Are you um, drinking right now? I drank two martinis during my last book talk and my mother called me and told me that I came off like a raving alcoholic. So <laughs> I have not given <laughs> myself a drink. Well, cheers. <laughs> this time around. <laughs> Mine were <laughs> different than that. Um, so I'm trying to keep it sober. But um, this is so every, even a book about war, The Diplomat's Daughter, which you kindly said was your favorite, I managed to put in a cocktail party. I mean, I can always find a way. So this is one of my favorite scenes. I'll only read a little because I think it's kind of boring when authors <laughs> read their own books. I'm always like, uh, I'm going to buy your book, so talk about something else. But this is one of my favorite scenes, and I'll tell you why in a second. So I'm just going to read a page. This is um, one of the main characters, Marcel de Fabry, who is French, and her lover, um, Koi Huynh, who is Vietnamese, and they are going to his best friend's party in Paris. His name is Sin. Where is Sin? I asked after a moment. Koi pointed to the couch. I looked and saw a slim Annamite man folded around the body of a girl in passionate embrace. Anne-Marie, I asked, smiling. Who knows, said Coy, laughing, but let's find out. A Frenchman in a smart suit was standing next to me. It took me a moment to realize that the pants he was wearing were three inches too high on his ankles, and there was a small monkey wearing a purple sweater and matching knit hat perched on his shoulder. I inched away, moved through the group of bodies, trying to attach myself to Coy. When we reached Sin, Coy slapped him on the back with gusto. You're here, you filthy bastard, Sin said after pulling his friend onto the sofa, and at just the wrong time, as always. I was intrigued by Sin, but I was transfixed by the woman he had just stopped kissing. She had stretched out on the couch and had her hands behind her head as if she were in a hammock. Her brown hair was very short and slicked over to the right in a deep part. She was petite, very slight, and wearing a man's tuxedo, though the crisp white shirt was barely buttoned above her navel. Hello, she said, registering that I was staring at her. I'm Anne-Marie de Lachaume. Marcel Marcin, a friend of Coy's, I said, returning her smile. Oh. A friend, are you? She said, batting her lashes over green eyes. How lovely. Well, then I suppose I'm, a, I'm, suppose I'm a friend of Sin's. He and I only met formally, and by formally, I mean physically, 
this evening, but he's been following me around like a lost dog for months. I don't think he thought I noticed, but I certainly did. How can you not with someone like him? And I'll stop it there. And obviously that is my favorite scene because there is a monkey wearing a purple sweater and a hat. And uh... <laughs> 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 I mean, it's a hero. <laughs> oh yeah. Very, very good, very good. Great, I right. it's a very well it's a very well trained audience. Check this out. And they stop on a dime. Um, so that was beautiful. It's like you're painting with words. Mm -hmm. um, and I love the, the dialogue that you're able to, to craft. Um, for those of you watching and listening, um, please think of questions you'd like to ask um, Karen because uh, you can ask them in the Q&A section and I'll be happy to bring them up. No question is off limits, though she um, may decide. <laughs> she can, <laughs> you can ask whatever you want. I'm not sure she'll... And she can say whatever she wants, but um, we're all friends here. So Indeed. ask her what you'd like. And I, will con I would like to just begin. And um, what was the motivation? What was the inspiration for taking on, I guess, this topic? You, it, and what was the inspiration to make you want to write this book? Because it's such a big decision, knowing what story to write. Why this one uh, in particular? Yeah, that's a, a very good question. I, you know, every time I start a book, I curse myself for not writing what I call girl walking on the beach books, like girl walking on the beach, beats a cute guy, there's some trouble, then they get together and voila. Like, why do I have to choose books about like 1933 Andoshin with like political turmoil, you know, the, the French, an American character, the Vietnamese, like why, why do I do this to myself? And I think it's because A, I like reading books that are like that. B, I like writing books that feel like they're filling a void, as in you haven't read this book a million times before. Um, and then C, like a little spark will turn into a flame. So I knew, I, I, there were like two things that interested me first in this book. I have always wanted to write a couple where the man was a very hot, sexy Asian man, and the woman was like a French woman. Um, my parents, my dad is Japanese, my mom is from Belgium. This is a pairing you don't see that much in literature and I really wanted to do it. I also really like writing rich people behaving badly and uh, attractive rich people behaving badly are often white. And I like writing characters that are not, but still get all the, all the fun stuff, all the money, the boats, the clothes. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I knew I wanted to do that, and I knew I wanted to do something where a lot of the research was in French. I had just put my kids into French school. I was like only speaking French at home, and I think something in my brain was just like, I must continue to do this in French. Um, and then I, I wanted to write a book about uh, colonial times. I, as I mentioned, my background is Japanese in Belgium. They were both, you know, they colonized badly. <laughs> <laughs> atrociously. Um, I actually lived, when I lived in Belgium, I lived near the Musée d'Afrique, this like colonial museum that was King Leopold's and it was horrible. But, um, you know, I'm a big fan of Marguerite Durat, the French mm -hmm. writer who, who was, uh, lived in Andochine when she was young. And I thought it would be a really good backdrop for the kind of story I wanted to write. I've also spent a lot of time there. I did toy with doing something with Belgian Congo, but I've never been there. And honestly, I didn't think I could do it well. So um, also yeah. having a rich Asian man in the Congo might be sort of off. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, so it's sort of all these tiny elements that come together. And then you write like two pages for your editor and you convince them that this is an amazing idea. And then you change everything. And there you go. I mean, the thing about the way I write books is I'll have this tiny character and then I'll be like, I like this character. This character is going to become a main character. And then I have to write everything again. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, as the book has come out, I've seen a lot of comments saying it's a very different type of historical fiction book. You've never read anything like this book. So that's made me really happy. I feel like it's, uh, it's a nice surprising story that is not like a World War II story, which is very right. Funny. Right. Do you know where the story is going ahead of time or do you write to find where the story goes? Well, I think I know where it's going and then I do it badly. Um, 
you know, first drafts are awful. They're extremely awful. I would rather mm -hmm. do like anything except write a first draft. <laughs> <laughs> I'll show you more embarrassing pictures. <laughs> um, I know where it's going, sort of. I know where it's going enough. Um, but when I turned this book in, my editor, who she's watching, hi, said, this is great, but it's like a house without a roof. And I was like, <laughs> that sounds bad, actually. <laughs> and so um, she told me that the main character's motivation wasn't strong enough. So I went back found a new motivation and then redid it. So it's not like the story changed enormously, but like what was in my character's hearts changed. Yeah, gotcha. I wanna take a couple of these questions that are coming in. I wanna pair them together. Katie writes, what kind of research did you do for the book? And Georgia B says, hi, Karen, I love the book, love this book and love hearing you read. What part of recreating the 1930s Indochine was most difficult for you? Hmm. Okay. Um, Hey, what was Katie's question? Oh, research. Okay, research, yes. Oh, if some French speakers here can't sleep at night, I've got a trove of historical documents that'll put you straight to bed. Um, actually, I found a website that had like every colonial government document from Andoshin on it, like everything. Um, so it was incredibly helpful, especially they had a lot of um, like inspecteurs de travail, like work inspectors, go visit the Michelin plantations, which play a very big role um, in my book, and wrote about all the atrocities um, that were on the plantations. That was very informative for me. I read, a, I read a lot of first person stuff. I read a book by a former worker from the Michelin plantations. Um, basically, I tr and then I read a lot of like things written in the 30s to kind of get the voice. Because you want to like pay homage to the voice, but you don't want to write exactly like the 30s or honestly modern readers get kind of bored. Um, so yeah, and then I did a, I watched a lot of like, these cool old videos of 1930s Hanoi. The book is principally in Hanoi. I spent a lot of time in Hanoi, but obviously not in the 30s. Um, I started all these Trello boards with like fashion and what people ate, what people wore. You like find menus from restaurants and all that's really fun. You can honestly get really lost in that and then never write a book. So I did yeah. cut myself off at some point. And then Georgia, hey, G, um, what was the hardest part about writing about the 30s? Yeah, yeah recreating Indochine. Yeah, Indochine. <laughs> um, recreating anything is, is pretty tough. The nice thing with historical fiction is you can recreate a lot and then fill in the gaps with things that were not there. Um, so, you know, I had to research sort of three different groups' lives. The French, uh, you know, the French lives, and then the richer Vietnamese lives, and then sort of the workers in the Michelin plantations. So I was sort of looking at three groups at the same time. Um, and what did they say? What did they eat? What did they do? And like the 30s, I think the hardest part was understanding how Andoshin was different in the 30s than the rest of the world, because the rest of the world was like modern depression and uh, the Michelins were actually making a lot of money off the backs of peasants, you know. So understanding like the place of Andoshin during the Great Depression was, was tough. Yeah, I hear you, okay. Um, Michael Morales, our friend Michael, he wants to know, are your characters reflections of people you meet in real life and how has your French American Foundation experiences <laughs> impact to your writing? I mean, all of you are in this book, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> no, you know, I, I do, um, I think a lot of characters are like inspired by many, you know, I always kind of have a fun, fabulous friend in all of my books. Um, and obviously the French American Foundation is just full of fun, fabulous people. And I will, I am guilty of like sometimes someone will say something incredibly witty and I'll just like subtly write it down and steal it. No, I won't steal like an entire conversation, but I will steal a line here or there. Um, you have so, a notebook? That you... <laughs> I have I have the notes app on my phone. I'm okay. very modern, um, as you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> modern background. Um, but no, there's never really one person. I will say, it's not a French American foundation person, but I really wanted to write like an Asian Jay Gadsby. Um, so Hoy Win, the lover of Marcel, uh, one of the French characters, is 
has this incredible boat and this incredible house and he throws these parties in it and he has fabulous clothing and he's just sexy. And that was really fun to do. Thank you for the question. Mike. Yeah, yeah. You touched on this a little bit. Um, Jordan Rebel asked, was there a big difference in the book's final results and the way you anticipated it during draft number one? Jordan. Um, yeah, I, you know, I actually had this British character who's in the book. His name's Red and he's kind of a rogue. Uh, and he's, I thought he was going to be a major love interest for one of my characters, but I started to write him. I didn't like him that much. I was sort of like, I hate you. <laughs> and I want to hate you. I want you to be the kind of this bad character. I don't want one of my ladies to fall in love with you. Um, so I ended up sort of changing that up. Um, and then I, and this is something we can go into more, I ended up consulting a professor of Vietnamese history whose field of expertise was exactly the 1930s. And she suggested I write an epilogue, which I had no intention to do whatsoever. Um, but it was a really good suggestion. It made it a lot better, I think. Why is that? Why did she suggest for you to do that? Well, she thought it would be a really good idea if I showed what the lives of the Colabo, the French who were sympathizing, the Vietnamese who sympathized sympathized and worked with the French, what their lives looked like after revolution. So 20 mm -hmm. years later, what happened to these people? So my epilogue is the daughter of my main character and it jumps to the 50s. Ah, like a flash forward. Yeah. Flash gotcha. Forward. Do you have a favorite um, scene and character? Um, my favorite scene is like this. this. Um, no, I, and I also, I love a boat scene. Don't get me wrong. And the boat scene in my book is in Halong Bay. And if anyone's ever been to Halong Bay, it's so beautiful. Um, it was so fun for me to write about that area. I have such fond memories of going there. Um, and there's all sorts of trouble. I think a lot of the times I write these fun scenes, just imagining a place where I want to be. I'm like, I really want to be at a cool party on a boat in Halong Bay. That sounds amazing. Um, and I want to drink magnums of Beverly <laughs> and all that stuff. So I did love writing that scene. I feel like there was more to this question and I have now forgotten. Uh, favorite character? Oh, favorite character, yes. Um, my favorite character is, is Hoi Win, is the lover of uh, Marcel, because he's, uh, he's a pretty complex character. I think his parents are very much in league with the French and he's trying to find his place. He's not a full-blown communist. He's, he wants to find a middle ground. He wants to sort of do it through economics, find independence that way, take back, you know, the natural resources the French had taken, rubber, opium, salt, silk. Um, and he's really trying hard to appease all these forces in his life. So it's, it's kind of a complex dance and, and he's just cool. Yeah. Jordan wants to know, well, that's the character you relate the most with. That I relate oh. the most with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I am awesome and I have an incredible <laughs> boat. That, um, no, let's see. The char so I always relate to the bad character, which hmm. I don't know what this says about me. Um, I probably relate. Empathy, to you're an empath. Yeah, I relate the most to, to Marcel, probably the French character who sometimes gets up to no good, but there's a I made sort of an officers club which they had in Shanghai but they didn't actually have in Hanoi I just shoved it north and um she and Jesse my my main main character have a crazy night there together and she makes Jesse do all this stuff and I feel like ask my college friends that may have been my role <laughs> as well yeah yeah um Megan Megan Carroll our friend uh she says great to see you and can you tell us about one of the most interesting, fascinating historical documents you came across as part of the research process for 100 Sons. And if time allows, tell us a bit about your, well, we'll talk about the next project at the end. Um, okay. But tell me, uh, you kind of went through this, but, and I, I did want to ask, like you said, you read through things about the 1930s, like what specifically was it that you were looking through? Well, you know, I, I read a lot of just like Hemingway was fun. I read, I reread um, all, like all those, all those, crazy expat writers, just more for voice. Um, but then 
the book that probably was the most helpful was a book called The Red Earth. And that was the uh, sort of the biography written by the worker for the Michelin Plantation, because he really went into extreme detail of what happened on the plantations, how awful it was, how people decide. I know it sounds like a real pick me up this book. Um, how, I mean, workers would just hang themselves. They would rather die than work there. I actually went to my car during all this and checked my tires to make sure they weren't Michelin and they weren't <laughs> much poor. But um, yeah, that book was, was incredibly helpful. And then a French, um, I think professor wrote a book, a very tedious book about the history of the Michelin plantations in, in Vietnam. So you sort of have to sort through like, the uber boring to find the history and then read like fun books that were just written during the period to find to find the voice you know i mean people spoke similarly but differently and you just want to sound like you know what you're doing basically yeah i don't know what i'm doing half the time i like to sound <laughs> like i know what I'm doing. yeah yeah talk yeah. to me a little bit about the process of putting this together like when did you embark upon when did you have the idea you wanted to write this book and then when did you submit it to the publisher you know it's i just don't remember <laughs> yeah. i mean it takes about you know i'm on like a book a year contract with my publishers um probably took me about a year to write it with and then some more edits after that. And then it doesn't come out for a year. So like now I've already written a new book, you know, and I'm kind of going back to this book. So it takes a really long time to hit the shelves. Mm -hmm. um, What's the daily process like for you? How do you get motivated to, to write? Yeah, well, publishers are really smart and they give you a third of your money before you even start writing. So that is the extreme motivation because they will take it away mm -hmm. if you don't put it in. And I've spent it. <laughs> no, very slow. Right. right. Um, yeah, no. So I'm a really big morning person. Politico kind of ruined me. They made me start at six o'clock in the morning. Um, so I usually wake up at four or five and start writing. My brain is just far better in the morning. And I always start with dialogue. I'm much better at dialogue than I am about like description. All of my beginning chapters are just people talking to each other. And I'll write like train shrub sky mm -hmm. like add later um because it's just i think my strength and it's nice to start with your strengths um and i did i knew the first chapter because the first chapter happens later much later in the second chapter it kind of jumps back in chapter two so i did write that pretty early on and i'm excited to say my first line of this book never changed so good yeah, I may have had no roof on my house, <laughs> but I, A, the title never changed and the first line never changed. Yeah. All right. Um, and then, so you wake up early, you write, and then yeah. do you write throughout the day? Do you take breaks? Do you go for walks? What's the... Yeah, I, uh, I mean, I, you know, I, I hustle a lot of other projects like you. I ghostwrite a lot. Um, so I kind of mix things in, but I'm better at creative things when my brain is fresh, I can kind of write like, I don't know, some white paper on whatever later on, but coming up with creative scenes is, is tougher for my mind. So I always do that early. Um, and then I, I do get a lot of good ideas when I'm walking and it's silent. I have to work in complete like pin drop silence. I wish I could be one of those people who worked in a bar. Like I want this. When I envisioned myself as a writer, I envisioned myself in a bar just you know, yeah, swinging casually, swinging from a chandelier. Um, so no music, no background music. Not, literally nothing. I often just wear earplugs and then have like noise canceling headphones with no no music on top of them. Gotcha. And do you write um, like the whole thing start to finish, or are you writing like in sections? Like, oh, let me let me jump ahead and write this section, and you put it together like a jigsaw puzzle later. Yeah, I think it's more jigsaw puzzle, and then um, like for all of you who I know are going to read the book, all this scenes in France all came after because my editor told me I had no roof. So I then, my roof came in the form of France and in, in flashbacks to France. So while it's kind of early in the book, I wrote them towards the end. Got it. And so your, your book, I've, I'm not all the way through it, but I'm, it's reading quickly, but you- Only you 400. Like, <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I'm about, I'm about a quarter through it. Um, and uh, you were able to build suspense quite well. How do you do that? Like, do you have like the writers like 
devices that like I want to know what's coming. How do you think about building suspense throughout the book and to make it to make it as much of a page turner as you do? Yeah, I think um, I always like to have a thread in a book. I'm not great at just being like, I'll just deeply explore the history of this family or something. I, I must have like a some sort of page turning device. It's not like, eh, you know, kind of murder or anything, but um, something that's going to keep you flipping pages. Um, I think you have to give a, a little, like, it's like breadcrumbs, right? Uh, and you just have to keep going that way. And then you have to sort of confuse people a little bit. It's weird. You like play puppet master and sometimes you do things and you're like, this is horrible. <laughs> like, this either gives it away or no one's going to see it, you know? So you try different things. I had a few little like breadcrumbs that I thought were good that were actually terrible that I took out. Um, and sometimes you write you write awful things. I mean, this is what I always tell people who are writing books. I'm like, your, your first draft is terrible, terrible, but it doesn't matter because you can fix it. Yeah. You just need something you can fix. So I do try to make it suspenseful as I write, but I certainly go back and go back and go back. Totally. Uh, Roy Cabla asks, are there some current public personalities that inspire how you think about your characters? If yes, anyone in particular? Public personalities? Yes. Um, let's see. I don't know. I mean, there's no one really. I mean, Emmeline Foster comes to mind. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I think honestly, a lot of my girlfriends, like, um, especially, you know, my main character has a child and she has sort of a, a fraught relationship with motherhood and i it's certainly something i talk to a lot of my friends about um but there's no no like public people who i'm like aha you you are a villain though i mean there are many villains <laughs> I could yeah, yeah. In this book i sort of pull from people i'm closer to than than public people gotcha talk to me about how this uh quarantine has affected the book rollout what were Ooh. you what were you going to do that has been, you know, canceled or postponed or reshuffled. I was not going to be in my parents' basement. <laughs> Someone else was going to do my hair. Maybe. <laughs> I was going to have my nails done. Three. No. Um, I mean, I had a big book tour planned. It's always very exciting. I mean, writing is so solitary that I, I, some writers hate book tours and, you know, like J.D. Salinger, I'm sure never wanted to go on a book tour, but like, I love people and I love, seeing people and meeting readers and i was sad that i wouldn't be able to do that but you know other industries are so much harder hit that i'm trying to roll with the punches and i'm really appreciative for platforms like this and people watching me not once but twice like i i thank you very very much clearly you got my e threatening emails um it's just it's it's harder to connect, I think, with people and convince them that your book, out of all the books ever written, that your book is worth reading. And I think it's easier when they meet you to do that. So, you know, yeah. tough, but I, I've sort of learned to play the long game. I think when I started writing books, I expected my books to just sell instantly and I'd be, you know, famous in 20 minutes. But like with my book, The Gilded Years, it was bought as a movie two years after it came out, you know? And so you never mm -hmm. know, you gotta kind of roll with it. Yeah, yeah. Um, Jordan asks, what's the biggest misconception people have about writing books? That it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Because <laughs> it's yeah. not. Um, I think people think, here's what I, I don't know. It's, it's fun for me after I have a first draft. First draft is a slog and I'm miserable and you don't want to know me. Um, after that, I love it. I love sort of taking words that exist and stories that exist and reworking them and adding things and making them better. But the first drafts are just awful. Um, secondly, it's just very lonely. You know, you have to be okay with just being alone with your brain for like, a year or so. <laughs> like it's just like you and the imaginary yeah, totally. people in your mind like you know um and i think a lot of people are just like i love it when people come to me they're like i'm just gonna write a book and i'm like all right just go do it like call me when you're done and then that phone just doesn't work <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's like super solitary and uh, and lonely you're absolutely right uh, do you ever get people asking you for free copies of your book 
Don't yeah. even think about it. Uh, no, I think <laughs> people know better. I mean, especially because I'm trying to sell something that's not that expensive, you know? Yeah. I think it always right. surprises me. It's like, hey, can I get a free copy? It's like, I just wrote the thing. I spent a year of my life, like, right? It's, I know. I mean, I'm happy to send it, but it's just kind of this, it is a misconception, I think, that people have that, first of all, you don't get that many author copies, right? I know. So. I only got 15. So, um, I, my favorite thing is when rich people are like, I'm in line for your book at the library. And I'm like, <laughs> I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> it's $18 on Amazon. Go. Yeah, yeah. Where, um, where should we, um, where should we direct people to buy the book? Is there a preferred vendor? Is it Amazon? Is there some local independent store? Right now, indie bookstores are really struggling. And if you can support an indie bookstore, that's amazing. Honestly, it's more expensive at an indie bookstore. It's $27 in an indie bookstore. It's $18 in Amazon. So I get it. Not everyone can support indie bookstores. Um, so really anywhere. Once my dad sold them out of the back of his car, which uh, was great. <laughs> but um, yeah, indie bookstores, if you can, they will really appreciate your business. A lot of them are doing curbside, curbside pickup. Gotcha. What's the indie bookstore near you? Is it Politics and Prose? Politics and Prose hosted my event on Sunday. Um, they're great, even though I froze like this like five times. So <laughs> we still love them. I'm over yeah, yeah. it. Yeah. Early, early reaction to your book. Have you had anyone get through it? I know it just came out. Um, has, have you got any early readers say, hey, they, they love it? or? Yeah. So if you go on Goodreads or Amazon, there's actually like over, I think there's 166 reviews already. Not that I'm wow. counting or looking. So <laughs> 66 exactly reviews on goodreads um and i it's you know i think it has like i know exactly what it has it has 4.17 stars nice. uh, out of five yeah which is good i'm excited you know i some people don't read their goodreads reviews but i do because i think you can learn from them honestly if some people are always going to hate your book it doesn't matter in my opinion if most people like your book that's what matters like you, you go on any book war and peace this is the worst book ever written you know like it's just yeah yeah Opinion. That's interesting. Tell me what you learned from your previous Goodreads reviews that you've kind of changed or something with your writing career. Um, I think sometimes people will say like, oh, historical fiction is a slow genre, you know? Mm -hmm. like, there's a very, it's psychological thrillers are incredibly popular right now. You know, if I was a smart lady, I would just be writing girl in the basement or something and making lots of money but like my brain doesn't really operate that way I wish it did or writing some dystopian YA novel like oh why yeah. can't I do this <laughs> um but I so I sort of took that to heart like people like historical fiction they like to learn they love to learn about history not through history books you know I like to write about maybe history aspects of history you don't already know about focusing more on women's history but I'm like okay I get I get that you want a page turner too you know so I think with this one I tried to make it more of a more of a psychological thriller and also when I sold the Gilded Years they were like we love this we can't wait to make it a movie but we're gonna make it a psychological thriller and I was like okay I get it you all you all want psychological thrillers so what are some of the great historical uh, fiction works that you like that inspired you to sort of go down this path as a writer so I actually never meant to go down this path as a writer. My first two books were in publishing. We would call them upmarket contemporary women's fiction. No one else calls them that, but that's what they call them. And they were modern day novels. You know, one was a Romana Clef about my time at Politico. And then I read an article in my alumni magazine about a woman named Anita Hemings who went to Vassar, where I went to school, who passed as white in 1897. And I started googling around and there was nothing about her and it just seemed sort of like a hole in history that I was interested in filling but I if I hadn't come across that story I don't know that I've changed to historical fiction then of course your publisher just wants you to do what's doing well so that was my most popular book and they were like no you now you write historical fiction but I don't think I'll stay only writing historical fiction I'm kind of jonesing to do something modern or like the 90s you know? mm. Is that what you're doing next? What are you doing next? Mm, my next book is set in the 50s. So it's not the 90s, but it's creeping, creeping. Yeah, creeping. yeah. Um, it's the 50s in New York City. And it's about a woman who becomes a mother and sort of hates it and has a nervous breakdown. And then she gets approached to be an FBI spy during the Cold War. So it's actually 
somewhat inspired by a true story as well. It's amazing to see how like stories just pervade your mind in this way. So many fake people in my brain. <laughs> um, I always tell people like, there's no lack of stories in my right. mind. There's just a lack of execution. <laughs> <laughs> Um, for those of you watching, if you have any questions for uh, Karen, just please um, drop it in the, in the Q&A section. I'll be happy to read it so she can opine And uh, in her first week of her incredible book. Um, tell me, what, while you're in quarantine, um, have you been reading much? Um, how, are you, how are you passing the time? Yeah, well, I've been edits on my next book. Um, I've sort of, like, that's a good part of quarantine is I don't have to get them done like that fast, I don't think. Um, but first round edits are pretty substantial and they're kind of scary. So that's what I'm doing right now. And then um, I, am, I am reading, I'm reading a book I really love called The City of Girls by Elizabeth Gilbert, which is sort of like a romp in New York City. It's fun. I, I'm kind of in the mood to read fun things. I'm reading Trevor Noah's biography, just like, mm -hmm. I feel like laughing and enjoying <laughs> enjoying lockdown as much as possible like i when i write books i don't watch tv at all ever um i just don't have time frankly it's not like i'm a snob that doesn't like tv right. but i uh so i'm like finally i binge watched a french show the bureau le bureau uh and that was so fun to actually watch tv again um yeah but i really should just be editing my book <laughs> Any advice for uh, people in quarantine now who want to write, whether something short or something long, like a book, what advice do you have for them? Yeah, I think it's a great time to write. One, I mean, like you're probably going blind for all the Netflix watching, so go blind from another app instead. Um, I think sort of difficult times can really inspire creativity. And, you know, I think, it's always worth a try. I think writing is kind of magical. You know, you, it's almost like you start doing it and then another part of your brain takes over and you just don't know what's happening, you know? Honestly, I was listening to my book on audiobook because I won't ever reread. I'll only listen because I'm so sick of the words, frankly. But audio, it's almost like someone else wrote it. And like, there'll be lines and I'm like, I have no recollection of this. Mm -hmm. I don't remember writing this. Um, and it's sort of fun. Fun. Yeah. So yeah, I would definitely, you know, there's a thing called NaNoWriMo, no, National November Writing Month, and hmm. you're supposed to write a book in a month. It's like this big challenge. So I think there should be like quarantine book writing or something where people try to, I'd love to yeah. see what came out of this. Time. Yeah, maybe it's, a, maybe it's a podcast. Yeah. Quarantine book series <laughs> with you, with you. I mean, hey, I <laughs> that's, that's literally most of the press I'm getting. It's going to be a travel and leisure best best books to read during quarantine. So. <laughs> hey, uh, I want to ask uh, just about your book. Tell me first, um, the cover of the book. Are, yeah. Of course, how did that come about? I really like it. Thank you. I really like it too. And they also put in this really cool um, map. Hold on. It's very hard to do upside down. A second. They made a really neat map of Andoshin. So you can see because it was like um, more than just modern day Vietnam. And uh, the back cover is really pretty. Do you like the stock of paper? We're gonna nerd it out, nerd out here. I love it. It's almost like a linen. Do I you smell your book? Really beautiful. <laughs> I have not smelled my book, um, but I think it's a beautiful book with an incredible details. I so in my contract it says author may weigh in on cover, which basically means author has no opinion whatsoever. Um, so one day. I, it just randomly pops up in my email and my agent will be like, it's here. What do you think? And I'm like, ah, and I opened it really quick. And I was, it's very much a first, you know, gut reaction. I loved it. I thought it was, it was gorgeous. And then they were like, we're going to do foil. And that's very exciting because. Yeah. Well, that's good. You're, yeah. you're unlike a lot of authors who are like disappointed with their book covers. I'm sure you've heard I've the story. I've been disappointed with my book covers, but you know, I will say St. Martin's um, has done a fantastic job. I'm, I'm very happy. Yeah. You mentioned uh, Netflix earlier, so we have an anonymous question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Inquiring Minds wants to know, have you watched Tiger King? No, I haven't. Um, 
you know, I, I'm going to, obviously, I have to. I feel like <laughs> I'm half dead inside because I haven't seen it. But I, I will. I will watch it. Got maybe, it. Maybe after I listen to your concert tonight. Right, right. Um, Katie wants to know, uh, are there any contemporary authors you admire? Contemporary? <laughs> Just kidding. <Yeah. laughs> what is that? No, uh, like, alive? <laughs> I, there's tons. Um, I ate up Crazy Rich Asians, like I inhaled it by Kevin Kwan. I thought it was genius and hilarious and so fun. And that would be a great quarantine read, honestly, because it's just a romp of a good time. Um, I love Amor Tolls, who wrote The Gentleman in Moscow. I really like his first book, The Rules of Civility. Again, a romp through New York City. Are we seeing a theme? Um, yeah, there's, there's just, there's amazing writers. And you know, right now, I feel like there's writers that wouldn't have ever gotten published 20 years ago, which is so exciting, you know? Yeah. I, you can, now you can write books about, you know, whatever, a young girl growing up in Senegal or in Serb, whatever country here, and there's interest, and it didn't used to be that way. Um, and it's exciting. I mean, the publishing industry is still very white. It's very waspy, but the people they are publishing are, is changing. Is there an audio book? version there is an audiobook and i got is to it? choose the readers actually oh, okay. people who are watching helped me um from bath so thank you uh which is fun and honestly my books are awful to narrate because there's so many voices and languages like there's tons of french in this book there's a lot of vietnamese which i obviously got help with um there's men there's women there's old people there's children <laughs> like you name yeah, it yeah yeah it's there and they did an incredible job and St. Martin's did an incredible job by giving like audio samples of every foreign word uh, for the narrators to do. So I've been listening to it, it's, they do a great job. Yeah, um, are you given an option to read your audiobooks yourself? <laughs> I mean, as amazing as you can all tell. I think it'd be great. Voices, I think I would be really bad at trying to mimic a Vietnamese man. I am not going to do it right now. Yeah. Um, no. So, the, so there's no. different voices for different characters? Yeah, well, there's two narrators. There's two female narrators, but they have to do everyone. Oh, okay. They do all the men, they do children, they do, they speak Vietnamese. I, it's, it's rough. It's hard. Right. I'm glad it's not me. Um, here's a question. In general, does finding the voice of people who, who lived and died a long time ago make the past closer to you? Do you really see them in their time when you write? Hmm. That's a great question. Yeah, I think I do. I mean, I honestly sometimes come up for air and I'm like surprised of the air <laughs> that I'm in, you know? I feel like I really try to be as close to the era as possible. Um, listen to the music, watch the movies if there were movies and read the books and read letters. You know, sometimes I'll just go on eBay and just buy things that were written or printed at the time just to even if the person wasn't famous just to get like more voices uh, from that time and I I really love that so yeah I think I do feel I do feel pretty close to them this you know everyone in this book is fictional but in the Gilded Years which is this purple book behind me uh in eight was written in 1897 old, most of the characters were real people so I would find their death certificates and stuff and one of my characters her father who put her through college as a gender died of exhaustion and like I almost cried I was like he died of exhaustion this is awful like you know so it's it's harder when they're real people yeah here's a question I, it says hi Karen you look fabulous as usual have an age one bit so many questions what is your beauty regimen how did how do you go about making the segue from reporter to novelist and a few more questions in there but we're kind of getting down to the the lightning round here so you have to <laughs> answer these quickly okay. um whoever said that one about me looking great i love you um my beauty regiment gina june wrote gina, that hey girl yeah. um literally only korean products on my face nothing american sorry to the french your products used to be the best the koreans have usurped you um I, the hair is all done with a straightening iron ghd makes the best one i watched the dallas kaibo cheerleaders hair tutorial I think it's, I think it's pretty effective. What came after that? 
it was kind of a non sequitur. It was how do you go about making the segue from reporter to novelist? Ah, okay. I, I always wanted to be a novelist. I just didn't know how to become a novelist in my 20s. I tried. I wrote a horrible book when I was like 21 and I pitched it to the biggest agent in America because I'm a genius like that. And she was like, wow, this is terrible. Um, but you're a good writer. Keep writing. Who knows? And I interpreted that as I am like the next, you know, John Steinbeck. So I knew what I wanted to do, but I thought journalism would be a good stepping stone. And it was. The only thing is like, I hate facts. So rumor has it, this is bad in journalism. Um, and I think journalism today is so driven by time and just getting the story first. And that doesn't interest me. I mean, no one cares how you write the news, you know, they just care that they get it quickly. And as a person who loves written words, it just wasn't enough for me anymore. Uh, but it definitely helped me get a book deal. I mean, being at Politico helped. Mm -hmm. Some questions about your last book that was optioned for the movie. Any updates on the status of the movie? Yes. Well, um, Sony just enforced Forza Majore. So <laughs> it's just moving and yeah. moving slower and slower. I got a nice new contract update. Um, you know, I don't think it's going to speed anything up. Hopefully it'll be made sooner rather than later. But I, I now understand how these things work. I mean, you know, Reese Witherspoon is sitting on a lot of really good books. She's been sitting on a book called Luckiest Girl Alive, which was a big hit for five years. So as much as we harass Reese Witherspoon, <laughs> like, uh, there's only so much I can do. So obviously, I'm really hoping it comes out soon, but I'm also really hoping to option the book I just wrote. So tell us about, yeah, that, that's the question. What okay. the question is about, do you anticipate making more movies from your books? So it sounds like yes. And if so, do you have any preferences for actors to play any particular roles? Um, yeah, so I never, I feel like I don't know actors enough. I'm not like great at, at hitting them. One of my friends who helped me with the Vietnamese in this book said, you know, Henry Golding, who was in Crazy Rich Asians, should play Hoi Win. Um, and I was like, no, it has to be a Vietnamese actor. Like, we can't just, you know, give the one. Asian, famous Asian person every role like there must be someone else um but my next book I definitely I, I had a meeting with a tv writer who writes for on a meeting a friend set me up with a tv writer who writes for billions and he was like do you want a tv deal write everything in New York and I was like no and I was like okay I'm gonna write something in New York so um you know I and I also found a story to like inspire it by and Hollywood loves a true story so I, I feel like I pandered a little bit with my next book, but I, I think it's probably my favorite book yet. I shouldn't say that considering I'm trying to sell you this one. This one is also very good. Who, who would play you in your biopic? Who would you want to play you in your biopic? Um, my editor said Olivia Munn. Okay. Yeah, which you know, you're Asian-ness and she's cool. Um, I don't know. I don't know who else. Someone. Who would, play, who would play your love interest? <laughs> oh, my love interest. Also, I used to get Liv Tyler a lot during Lord of the Rings. Um, my love interest. Um, anyone who went to college with me knows my obsession with Lenny Kravitz, though he's <laughs> aging a little bit. I still love him. Um, actually, just going around like Lisa Bonet's love circle works for me. Jason Momoa, fine, no problem. Not kidding. All right anytime soon cool cool uh paula farina says my 91 year old mom says she can't put it down your book oh thank you um paula farina's mom is like the person who i if she likes it then i know that everything's okay yeah so. uh well good is there anything else that you think i should ask that is a burning burning thing you want to put out there for the world to um, know no i mean honestly i i really can't express how appreciative i am of people taking time to do this i i'm i read all these articles about like oh we have so much more time now and that's just so false you know i have no time and i know other people have no time so the fact that you take an hour out of your quarantine life to listen to this i i'm incredibly incredibly thankful and i'm very thankful to kabir who is in a, just a basically a genius. I remember first reading his bio and being like, I'm going <laughs> to... So, that's wonderful. I just want to say, Karen, 
but every, we all love you. And all of us on this panel are very supportive of your book. Settle down, hold on, settle down, let me put this. The crowd's crazy. All right, let me just, okay, cool. No, but I would just say um, for all of you watching at home, check out the book. Um, you can get it on Amazon delivered to you. They'll drop it off outside yeah. and um, you know, you can, it's clean, it's hygienic, it's totally cool. You can, <laughs> you can get the Kindle version, the Audible version. There's multiple formats. Yeah. Um, and then check out uh, Karen's social media so you can see how she's leading this uh, virtual book tour. And we really need to support her because there's a lot of work that goes into these books and we want to make sure that she feels loved and supported and um, recognized for what's really a remarkable read. So congratulations on putting it together and getting it out into the world. Oh, well, thank you so much, Kabir. Honestly, coming from you, that, that means a lot. And let me just plug Kabir's concerts that he does every night at 10 o'clock. He's an incredible musician. He played... You have to turn off the party. So <laughs> I'm trying uh, to play it, play you off on this. Oh, no. <laughs> played for FAF uh, when we were in Chicago, and he was incredible. And I, I think what you're doing is super cool. I like kind of fall asleep before ten, of them. <laughs> but tonight I am there for you. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, I think we're um, done. Emmeline, tell me what I need to do to bring this to a close. Maybe you can reappear. I, I forgot what the instructions oh. were at the end. Hi, Kabir. This is Val. Oh, hey, Val. Welcome. Hey. Yeah, um, yeah, I just have a few quick announcements um, before we end. But um, again, I mean, thank you so much, Karen and Kabir. Uh, I'm sure I can speak for everyone online right now when I say this is a wonderful way to end the day. Um, so announcement number one, like Karen said, um, Kabir hosts a live stream concert series throughout the week. Uh, with the featured artist each night. And tonight's concert is with Ariana Kim, Grammy-nominated violinist at 10 p.m. And um, number two, our next webinar will take place next Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern time with author and editor of the Paris Review, Emily Nemens. Um, so again, thank you to both of you, to FIAF uh, and to everyone who joined us tonight. Uh, we hope to see you all next week and have a good rest of your evening. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye.